I guess I should stand in front of the mic over here. All right, so my name is Adam Fisher. I've been uh, in the security industry now about uh, eight years. I've focused a lot uh, on identity and access management, hence the uh, topic here that we're going to discuss today. Um, I spent a lot of time in the enterprise space, so I've dealt with a lot of large uh, companies, a lot of Fortune 500, uh, Fortune, Fortune 150, whatever you want to call it, and uh, I have had an opportunity to work abroad, so I've lived in England for 18 months, and uh, so not only learning about uh, how access control is managed here in the States, but also how EMEA and other countries look at it as well. Uh, and what I want to cover is uh, going to kind of give us a background here a little bit on um, why access control, kind of the history of what we see, uh, kind of how we got to where we are today, and some of the uh, decisions that were made that kind of put us where we're at. Uh, we're going to take a look here then about how where it's going, right? So we have the traditional security model. And then what it's going to take for us to really kind of move ahead uh, in the new world of business, kind of look at the difference between roles and attributes, and especially um, kind of how security has always taken a no answer to things, right? We're going to secure things, the answer is no, but really we need to have more of a knowledge idea about who our users are and how they're interacting with our, with our organization, with our business. So one of the, the key points here, uh, and this is kind of a, a growing trend that we see, right? Uh, in the world of uh, enterprise, in the world of business, security isn't just a, a tool, it's not just an organization, um, but it's something that needs to be leveraged uh, to increase the way that uh, businesses interact with their customers uh, and how they're going to uh, really um, protect not only their brand, uh, but the data that their customers hold. Uh, with the open enterprise uh, that's, that's, a, that's around us, um, we're sharing more data now than we ever have, and we still have to be able to control that and secure that. So an indication of this is some of uh, the new reality, some of these numbers here that we, that we see uh, in front of us here. So we got, you know, 79% of organizations are, are using secure uh, cloud applications, SaaS applications, services in the cloud. Um, you know, we see the, the growing social trend. Um, the number of devices um, uh, that are, that uh, applications now, are, a business now create for mobile devices. Um, especially when we look at APIs, not going to talk about APIs today, but especially around how that is, um, you know, increasing the amount of data that we share across the business lines. Um, and then, and all this is going to continue, right? So this is what we're facing. This is kind of the the growth here. And so, with this, right, we've seen, um, you know, kind of a prol proliferation then of awesome solutions like LifeLock, and you know, password. Um, storage things, whatever, you know, if you use like LastPass and things like that, because we, we have such a prolific digital identity, uh, it's, you know, we need to secure that now. Um, and so why are we here? We're here because there's products that exist um, like this. Uh, so we're, let me get over here, Let's see if I can swing this. Maybe some of you have seen this, maybe some of you haven't. Um, but because of our digital identity, we get, we get products like this. And exactly. What's this? Oh, we're going to see this right here. Because of this, you get products like this? Oh, no, we're not. It's, give me a sec. Somebody's got to get on the internet to show this to you. I was almost there.
Come on. Is there a play there at the top? Mm. Why aren't you playing? Oh, I'm trying. I'll jump out to YouTube and show this here in a second. There we go. All right. We're getting there. Marshalls. I don't know if you love them as much as I do, but I found one. It's a new product that I want to share with you. Can and, you hear uh, that? You know, if you have a hard time remembering your online passwords, a lot of people have a lot of different passwords. This is going to solve your problems. Online passwords. There's just too many. And who can remember all those tricky combinations? So you stick them on your monitor or you hide them in a drawer. But not anymore. Introducing Password Minder, the personal logbook that takes the hassle out of passwords. Forget about sticky notes or scraps of paper, because Password Minder has been specifically designed to organize and safely store passwords. You'll find them in an instant and never lose a password again, guaranteed. Need to make a password? Just add it to your Password Minder. The alphabetical listing organizes all your usernames and passwords for instant recall and easy reference. I don't have to worry anymore about security or identity theft. I now have all my passwords in one place. It's free. If you have passwords, you need Password Minder. So call now and get your very own Password Minder book for just $10. That's real. That's real. Wait, you're telling me I can keep all my passwords in one place? In this right here and it's only $10? For half the price, you could write all your passwords on a $5 bill. <laughs> this is insane. Does this seem safe to keep all your passwords in one place? In a place that's labeled Internet Password Minder? <laughs> I don't think they thought this through fully. I mean, what if someone gets their hands on your password minder? So I came up with this. It is Ellen's Internet Password Minder Protector. And what you do... Yeah. You put it in here. You close it. And then it has a built-in combo combination lock right there. You see on the side? And I know you're thinking, Ellen, what if I forget my combination? Well, if you order now, I will do this. You can put it in there. It's the password minder protector minder. <laughs> it's the one place to keep your password minder protector combination. And I have one more special offer. If you don't feel like writing down your passwords, send them to me. <laughs> and for $10, I'll write them down for you. <laughs> don't worry about sending me your credit card information. I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you believe that? So what's funny about that, right, is that it's real, okay? And that's an actual product that existed. It's about, it's about 2011, 2012, um, and it's real, right? And so that's the environment that our, um, our users, you know, that's the, that's the environment the public lives in, right? Believe it or not. And people buy that kind of crap. Yeah, I'll get one for you. Just send me, give me a $5 bill or I'll run down for you. Right, and so this kind of, this is this is where we're at. So, you know, and moving through then, right? So we have to we, we're we're looking here as, as ways to se to secure our access, uh, to control it in ways better than this. And so, what were some of the, uh, you know, what are what are ways here that we're moving forward then? All right, to to set the stage here, then we're going to talk a lot about moving forward here as an access control model. All right, and this is simply a framework that detects how us, our users, access an object. All right, it's that simple. Some of the first ones here that we that we came across, right, was discretionary access control. 
All right, we see this a lot on Linux, Unix. Um, it's decentralized owner discretion, right? So this is kind of where the term data owner came from, right? So I own a file. I can then determine who gets access to that file, okay? Read, write control, access control lists. Um, permission rules are attached directly to the object, all right? So pros of this, easy to implement, great flexibility. Um, it's built into nearly every operating system. Um, but the cons, and this is definitely a big one here where we see around uh, enterprise level where they have thousands, 2,000, 4,000. Uh, I worked at an organization that had 250,000 Unix servers. Okay? That doesn't scale well, right? When you're doing everything is assigned on the object across all those servers. And you're right, there's no central implementation. Hence, what do we have now with Unix? AD integration, Active Directory integration, LDAP, Kerberos. All of that is to centralize. Uh, those logins. And then because there is so much manual task in there, it's not centralized. I mean, I don't know about you, but how many people have changed the permissions across their whole, <clears throat> you know, root file structure or thought they did it on one folder, but there went your whole Etsy directory. Or, um, and so here we go, right? So that, that those types of things, prone for mistakes. Um, another thing that came around, around early on was uh, mandatory access control then, right? So Mac stuff. Uh, and this is where we get into data classification, all right? And this is obviously something that the government um, uses, Defense Department uses. We're all familiar with the top secret, secret classified, unclassified level here of the, of the, of the data. Uh, and so what's good about this, right, is uh, subject with clearance, uh, the same or above the object uh, has access to the object. So if I've got top secret level clearance, I get everything down below, right? I can read... Uh, I can read everything down below and I can write top secret. Um, but if I'm at level two unclassified, I can't read above and I can only write unclassified information. Um, and that's where the mandatory access control comes in. So it's more secure, it scales easier, uh, but limited user functionality, expensive to implement, and obviously there's a high administration overhead because you're constantly looking at that data that's classified and you're updating that classified information. Okay? And now this brings us to uh, really where we're at here with uh, role-based access control. All right, role-based access control came around um, really kind of around whenever directory uh, information came around. So first was DAP around 89, 90, maybe even earlier than that, um, and which was the directory access protocol, and then LDAP came around with the lightweight directory access protocol. Um, and what that brought into the, brought into the realm here was uh, really the ability for us to start uh, classifying almost like an intermediary layer with groups. Okay, and so groups became very influential in the, in, the, in the LDAP infrastructure, right? So we're able to classify users not just by, um, you know, perhaps their name, but we were able to classify them by a role. And we're able to centralize this information easier. Um, role permissions are enforced um, as well through an ACL, but uh, the, big, the big ticket number here, right, was that a user could be a member of, of more than one role, more than one group at a time, right? So uh, it was easy for us to then uh, add, just add the user to the group. He's got the access. We don't need to think about it further, okay? Another higher level layer of abstraction. So we kind of go through here and take a look at this. And, um, and when, we, when we look to build out a role model, right, we're looking to find... Uh, patterns between our users, and so you know, starting with this type of a uh, type of a scale here, simply we have users on the left, uh, the systems on the right, and I got to get my users over there. Okay, so if I was to do it without uh, you know much much fanfare, kind of go through what does he need, what does he need, and perhaps he needs every system, perhaps he needs just a few. Uh, but if we were to do this normally, right, kind of what we're seeing here through. Um, you know, a discretionary model, this is kind of what it would look like. And we kind of can see um, that doesn't look too pretty, right? We've got some, we've got some issues there. And so we need, a, we need another layer of classification. So if we want to do a general employee, bam, we have a general employee model, right? We hear this referred to in the industry as birthright access, right? I hire a new employee. What, what basic access does he need? Corporate network, access to the directory, email, okay? Bam, that's what he gets. All right, but perhaps we have other classifications of users. Uh, what else are they going to need? All right, so we start looking at a finance role. 
right? So these people are people specifically in the finance department. Moving forward, same thing with the sales department. Okay, so we can start segregating our, our users a little bit better. And we kind of can see where this goes. We get to a point here where now we have a higher, le higher level layer of abstraction. Um, and this worked great. This worked great for a lot of instances in security whenever everybody was in-house, whenever everybody pretty much came to the office, sat down, and that's where they accessed the data, right? Uh, there was none, none of this mobile uh, interaction. There was none of this uh, partnership, federation. I don't have contractors that need my data. I don't have partners that I need their data from, right? Everything is is in our tight little data center, and uh, this is working great. And you can see here, right, so the everything from the roll to the right is nice and clean. You know, not a lot of mess over there. It's fairly, it's, it's well-defined. I know exactly what access each role is going to give. Over on the left, I still have my thousands of users, um, but that's okay, right, because once I get into the role, everything's clean. And so what does this give here? So... Um, you know, the pros, it's scalable to some degree. Um, and, you know, the second point here for the pro, right, was really, really kind of nice. Great for organizations with high turnover. Um, gone are the days, right? I mean, at least, at least for us, we, we, we move around between companies kind of more frequently. Uh, definitely more than, uh, you know, than my, my father's generation, and I'm sure yours as well. And so organizations ha are, are experiencing more of this turnover. And simply stated, right, user-to-role membership changes frequently, uh, but role-to-object permission does not. And, uh, and because of that, the role RBAC has, has taken a, a big spot, a big place um, in, in organizations and in access control. Um, but simply sitting here on the con side, uh, there's a possibility of role explosion. All right? And role explosion is simply the case where we become so dependent on roles that it, we defeat the purpose, okay? There's too many exceptions to the role rule, right? So you're part of a finance department. Oh, but but he's an admin in the finance department. Oh, okay. So now we have a finance admin role. Oh, but we have, we have a finance dev role now. Now we have a finance test role. And I've, I've worked in organizations where 5,000 users, 10,000 roles. Wait a second. Right? How does that work? What's the purpose of a role model if that's what we're creating? Uh, I've been in organizations where literally they've broken Active Directory. You didn't think it would be possible, but yes. Active Directory can no longer function because a user has so many group memberships that the Kerberos ticket is too large to pass to the network and they change to the TCP port 88 to handle that. Right? And that's what we're talking about, role explosion. So there, there's not enough admin oversight. There's not enough planning. But we see that, and that's exactly why things are limiting. Things are going this direction. We're no longer in a traditional security model, right? So we have the bad guys, and we build up this big wall, right? We dig a moat. We put up our castle walls. We have our nice big firewall. It's sitting there. Everything in it is secure. But how does that enable the business? Is that business agility? or stagnation, right? How are we going to work with our customers? How are we going to market? How are we going to partner? How are we going to have any type of uh, influence in the marketplace if that's what we continue to move with? Now, this is okay, right? Because, you know, coming this way, pretty much everybody came down. It, it was a lot easier to say no here, right? Nope, you're not going to have uh, your corporate email on your tablet, on your smartphone, on your BlackBerry, right? We all went through the BlackBerry stage, People started getting these fancy new BlackBerry devices. They wanted email on them. The wall starts coming down. And that's where we're at now, right? That wall is down. So how do we secure it now? Now that the business is open, how do we secure what's inside? How do we secure our data? How do we protect the company image? I can tell you right now it doesn't work like this. And there we go. Ah, 
I just blew it. Do that again. Security software protect your whole business. Sector 12 now secure. Not just pieces. Ours can. See it. All right. So a little, you know, that, that's funny. We laugh at it, but uh, isn't that not the truth? Isn't that kind of how we look at things, right? As long as it's outside of the perimeter, as long as it's outside of where I focus, is it still my concern? You know, I, I guarantee you, Target probably said that, right? Our perimeter is secure. I don't care about my HVAC vendor. I'm good, right? But those days are gone, right? Okay, we see what happens when, uh, when we take that stance, right? So we have to look beyond just uh, what we control, what our data controls. Um, we see this happening because of where we're at now. Um, and so I, I really like this graph, and I think this... Uh, um, you know, it indicates here what we're seeing as far as our digital footprint and what's happening. Uh, and, and so really here, over the last um, couple years, there's, you know, we're up to 93% now of information stored, on, stored digitally, as opposed back to, you know, 1988 when information was 0.7% was stored digitally. Think about everything that we access now is either internet-based, uh, is, is, you know, it's stored on a hard drive somewhere, right? I mean, when was the last, I mean, at least for me, um, you know, I, I, that's pretty much exactly how, how everything is going. When we see what the healthcare record is now, right? Everything in healthcare has got to be stored, you got electronic healthcare information, uh, HIPAA. Um, that's exactly what we're seeing, this spike here in all of this. And so with that, we need an access control model that isn't focused, uh, that is more focused on digital information, Okay. What's digital information? Digital information is attributes. We're looking for information on the digital data. That's where the access control needs to reside. And so that's what we're here talking now about what's coming next, which is an attribute-based access control model. Okay? Why is this good? Okay, because we're able to apply controls on subjects that are not associated with the organization. Okay? It's much easier for me to apply an attribute-based control on an incoming user from external to my organization than for me to look at a role and say, oh, he's not in a role, he's not going to get access. You know, I'm not going to expose my Active Directory group infrastructure to my partners and to my external users, to my customers, who still might need to get access to parts of my internal applications. Uh, ABAC is more expensive. Um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, more expressive and can support multi-factor decisions, physical location and strength of authentication. And, and this is kind of key here as well, right? It avoids the need to assign explicit authorizations before the access is attempted, right? So it's more real time. When I access that object, I can look at what that user is bringing with him. You know, the whole B-O-Y-I-D, bring your own identity. Whatever he brings with him, whatever system he's coming in with, I can then authenticate that user or give him access to whatever he's requesting. Same thing we see, right, when we see this web page, sign with Facebook, sign with Google. It's all that kind of stuff. What's he bringing in from Google? What access is he bringing that allows me to get access to what I'm requesting? All right, so real-time context, segregation of duty. Right now, the big cons is it's disruptive, okay? We're getting away from this directory. We're getting away from this role-based uh, mindset where I have to have explicit control of what users are coming in and accessing my stuff. It's not open enough. Um, and then the key thing here, though, right, then is it becomes more of I really have to manage the attributes of the, my users more so than uh, perhaps maybe their group membership. And so we'll kind of look at the ABAC timeline. This really started kicking off around 2009 with the first FICAM roadmap, uh, implementation version 1.0. Uh, I'm going to pull a lot of the information that you're going to see on the subsequent slides from version 2.0 that came out in 2011. 
And this is where ABAC was recommended as the access control model for promoting information sharing between diverse and disparate organizations. Uh, and from there, it continues to grow. Uh, last year, there was a, the NIST guide to ABAC, which is very good. Um, if you're an uh, identity junkie like me, I found it interesting. Uh, but then it, even now, it's gained enough traction in five years since 2009 or three years since 2011 to where Gartner is now predicting that by 2020, 70% of all businesses will use ABAC. All right, and we can see that shift in the amount of digital identity that's stored and how we have to control access to the digital identity. Uh, and same thing from Kup Kup Kupinger Cole, uh, who released the Compass report on dynamic authorization. Uh, is the most exciting area in identity and access management today. So for me, that's exciting. If you're an identity junkie, hopefully it's exciting for you as well. And so let's take a look at some of the hindrances, some of the things that FICAM brought out that said this is where we're seeing roadblocks, okay? Traditionally, access control has been based on the identity of the user requesting execution of a capability to perform an operation on an object, either directly or through predefined attribute types such as roles or groups. We know that. Uh, practitioners have noted that this, that this approach to access control is often cumbersome to manage given the need to associate capabilities directly to users or the roles or groups. And that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Especially when you have you know, a number of users in a complex environment, the complexity of the environment makes the RBAC process complex as well. As where opposed an access control model should make it simple, it makes it complex. It has also been noted that the qualifiers of identity groups and roles are often insufficient in the expression of real-world access control policies. And uh, so here, right, the alternative is to grant or deny user requests based on arbitrary attributes of the user and arbitrary attributes of the object. And so here we're talking right, right again about it's the attributes of the user and the attributes of the, of, the, of the object that should determine how we gain access, how we access that information. And so often this approach is ABAC. And so this is going to be some advantages here of ABAC then, right? So access control policies that can be implemented in ABAC are limited only by the computational language and richness of the available attributes. ABAC enables precise access control. It allows for a higher number of discrete inputs, providing a bigger set of possible combinations of those variables to reflect larger and more definitive set of possible rules to express policies. Basically, it's more scalable, okay? It's more scalable. It allows for, the, for us to simplify an environment as it gets more complex. This flexibility enables the greatest breadth of subjects to access the greatest breadth of objects without specifying individual relationships. We don't have to be so fine-grained, uh, but we still gain that ability to implement fine-grained controls. And so I bolded this here. Under ABAC, access decisions can change between requests by simply changing attribute values without the need to change the subject-object relationships to find the underlying rule sets. And so why is that important? Because it's a lot easier for me to change an attribute. Why? Because that usually comes from an HR system, usually comes from a job change, right? So if I change jobs, my department changes, immediately my access changes. So I don't know about you guys, but when I work at a lot of customer sites, that's the biggest thing I see. A job change happens, and what happens? He maintains his last 10 years worth of access because nobody takes him out of the freaking group, right? Well, now there's no group to change. He changes his attribute, his access changes. It's that simple. We don't have to change the rule set that implements this either, right? The rule set is static. We set the rule, you're in this department, you get this access. Now my department changes, the access is gone. It's that simple, right? And so just because he has another um, layer of uh, access inside a department, all that is, we're gonna take a look at this a little bit later, another line in the rule set, okay? All right, and so kind of what brought us here, right? So now traditional security and we're moving into an attribute-based identity security model. And why? So take a look, read these. I think these are, you know, I don't like using Dilbert as proof points, but these really relate, relate to what I have to say, right? So I think they're pretty effective. You know, and we, and we joke about it, um, but I think it's because we've all experienced this, right? 
you know, um, back in like 02, 03, I lived in, uh, you know, I was, I was working in an environment like the first one here, right? People were coming to us and saying, hey, we want to get an email on this new BlackBerry that I got. You know, I want to I be able to access, you know, this from home. I've got a broadband connection that's up all the time. I want to access this from home, right? And now everything's gone mobile, you know, and, and really, you know, I mean, my son, right, he, he, he goes, he gets my laptop, he's four years old. Does he reach for the mouse or does he reach to touch the freaking screen on my laptop? He looks, looks to touch the screen, right? And that's exactly how we're going. So we're, we're in an open business. Um, and so now that wall is gone, right? So how do we protect it? We can't have a big, you know, a big massive um, castle in front of our business anymore. We, we've had too many holes through it to call it a firewall to begin with. Um, and so now the, the, the security has to be on the identity. Okay, and that's and that's where we're talking about attribute security, right? And the beauty part about about this is even now from an insider threat perspective, I'm supposed to have a desk in the office. I'm supposed to walk in there, and but now you know I don't like you anymore. Take Sony for instance, right? I don't like it. I'm going to screw up your systems. But even from an insider threat perspective, from a, from a perspective of least privilege, um, this covers the insider threat basis as well. Okay, so we're protecting the shared account passwords. We're controlling the privileged identities. Um, we can record the access, and so what this allows us to do is implement least privilege, reduce the risk, um, and uh, improve accountability to our administrators and so forth. And that's what we're after here with an identity perspective. This brings us to where we find security now, where you know less is more. That's the common thing. We still face the same type of uh, requirements, right? We still have to enable the business while we protect the business. And that's really kind of with the open enterprise, everything we hear about an open business now, um, security's responsibility to enable the business to perform, to increase revenue, is really taking a, a different view, right? It's taking a different um, look at security. And so we've gone from a situation where we say no to everything, where we protect the business, no, you can't have your BlackBerry, or, or you know, when iPhones came out and everybody got, everybody got an iPhone, they wanted this and that, to how are we going to enable our users, enable the business in a situation of security? Okay, how are we going to secure the data so that they can use it on their phones, so they can be more productive, so we can interface with our partners, so we can interface with... Uh, our contractors and have secure relationships. Okay, and so let's take a look here then a little bit on a fine a fine grain level here of of ABAC from an attribute based control. What are the what are the pieces in place to implement an attribute based control system? Um, I'm not going to follow the terms on the left. I'll just follow the diagram here. The terms are in alphabetical order. But first, we have a policy enforcement point. This is simply an endpoint. All right, so this is something I'm going to log into that has, um, you know, either an agent, a connector, or a tie-in to the PDP. There's a number of ways, there's a number of solutions, commercial solutions that will implement that. But a higher level of PDP is simply an endpoint, policy enforcement point. It's some place that's implemented ABAC control, whether that's a file server, the Windows share, web server, whatever it may be. Uh, the decision point is the rules, right? So this is what's storing the rules uh, that evaluates my access request. So uh, it looks for my attributes, it looks for the object's attributes, and whatever other additional parameters that we've set in the rule. We'll take a look at that. Um, and so this really then ties back to the decision point. I mean, kind of look at the decision point as a service. You're just going to be sitting there running, looking for requests, and it's going to process those. It's basically a tie-in then to a policy repository. This is a database um, or an information point um, that can that can contain a number of different uh, environment variables. Um, policy repository is a database that holds the rules. Okay, and the and the PAP, the administration point, think of it as a web GUI that helps me create the rule set. Okay, and so now instead of me going to Active Directory and saying you know make me a member or member of or or whatever. I would go to the PAP and create a new policy rule. Okay, create a new create a new attribute rule. Uh, maybe we do have a new department coming on. Uh, we just had an M&A activity, acquired a new company. They have a couple new rules. We'll create those. 
that's where we would go to do that now and we leave those groups alone. All right, and so coming, to, coming back to this slide, now instead that middle really becomes one big box. It becomes the policy decision point. Okay, and in there, I'm going to have those decisions. Title equals sales. User has an employee ID. Department equals finance. It all sits right there. I have one place to go to make the change. I have one place to go to address the attribute needs of my organization. And then that is pushed out to the endpoint systems. I go there for the request. If the request is granted. I'll gain my access. Okay. So the standard that is implementing attribute-based access control is referred to as Exacable. Okay. Uh, extensible access control markup language um, at a high level it just defines it defines the the, the, the XML. All right. It defines the rule set, what format the XML needs to be in to be consumed. Okay. And so to look at it here, this is a simple access control rule, okay? And, I'll, and there's a key thing here, though, and it's, it's what kind of gets referred to in this as a primary attribute, the policy. So policy, role equals manager, action equals view, resource type equals a document. Rule one, deny if the document owner is not this user ID. So we're saying whoever's user ID it is specifically, that's who can get it. Rule two is permit. Um, but what's the first line here, right? Role equals manager. And that's a common misconception when we say we're moving to an attribute-based access control is that roles are gone. Obviously, we're not going to be deleting groups. They, became, they become what we call a, a, a primary attribute. So it may still be easier for me to put, you know, a group of 10 managers that span over a course of 10 departments into a specific role. And then I could say role equals manager. All right, so if I'm in the manager role, I can still get there. Really, I see this going away. Eventually, I don't think roles will be in there um, because then what happens? Well, now we have a generic term that refers back to groups. Okay? But for sake of migration purposes, and so people that like our back don't get offended, we allow them to find a role in there. Okay? And I think that's how we see this uh, trans and migration process moving forward. Um, by, by just leveraging currently what's decided in there by roles. Okay, and so what happens uh, if there's two or more roles? Um, I wanted to cover this because this is a common thing where you know, might have, you know, now instead of role explosion, you have rule explosion. Um, there's always going to be some level of complexity out there. Um, but this is an another example here of what we'll refer to as permit overrides, so we can be able to define, um, you know, specific rules that have higher priority than others. Um, to implement those, and so that makes it uh, you know that makes it easy to um, be able to limit the amount of uh, uh, you know I, I guess rule explosion that we would, that we would expect to see. Uh, and so a couple of the ABAC implementations currently out there, we see a lot of this coming on board. So Microsoft Windows Server 2012 was implemented a, a form of it in claim claim based access control. All right, where essentially they're passing around an a claim that they refer to as an ACL, which is really an attribute rule. Um, Fedora 3.3, which is nice, you can read up on, on that implementation um, as well. And there's lots of third-party com companies such as Axiomatics, Avatir, uh, that uh, have uh, you know commercial off-the-shelf type uh, solutions um, that, you can, that you can leverage. Uh, so with that, um, open up any questions or, or comments that we have, um, yeah. Correct. When I make that request, I say, I am this person, here's my role. How is that still validated? Are you going to look through still you know, a directory that, that signs the claim and everything? Or? Right. So, so not so much with the claim, but what we see here, the policy decision point is going to validate the insertion against what we see from the policy repository. So it's going to have a, you know, it's, it has the list, it has the information in the repository that, We've defined sort of that rule set is, and uh, bases it off of that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, very good point here. We're not talking about usernames and passwords here. They can get authenticated somewhere else. This is another step. 
farther down on, on that chain of authorization where and really what we refer to this is almost like fine-grained authorization so we can get very specific on on who's accessing what so you may be authenticated but not authorized Yeah, very good. So SAML 2.0, the, uh, the Federation standard we see currently, uh, what, it has those attributes in there. We can put a lot in that insertion. A yeah, good point. Other questions? Um, why is it called dynamic objects? What's dynamic objects? It seems like you're still writing rules. You're still writing rules. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't see how that, all that differs from the site. So, okay, good question, good question. So the dy dynamic auth authorization is more based because it's coming from me. So from a static perspective, roles are static. I have to manually be added to that role. Whereas for me, my, my attributes changes, that can, be a, that can be a dynamic process. As soon as it happens, it's already updated on the endpoint, right? Or I, my authorization is already updated. So there's no, there's no middle step there. I don't have to go to a role. Like, so my attributes can change, but my, my authorization will be the same. Right, somebody has to go to an app, go to a, a role and pull me out, remove me from a from, from a group. Is that, is that answering your question? Um, not exactly. So, so you as a user can change your own attributes. I mean, most likely not, but possibly. I don't. I don't. I won't see that happening though. But usually, do you have a comment on this? Okay. No. So yeah, no. I I wouldn't expect a user to to necessarily go in and change their job title to. CEO and then right. have that happen. Um, so, but it still takes human intervention, right, to, to make a change. So, you know, if, if I'm a user and then I change the partner, you know, somebody in the admin still has to go in and, you know, set an attribute flag, you know, this guy's now, you know, he's still a manager, but now he's also a manager. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. I guess I just don't understand why that dynamic stuff is there. I mean, it makes it <laughs> so I mean from a from a dyna dynamic perspective the way I the way I viewed attribute based is that there once that change happens on my user attributes there is another change so from a from a role perspective my attributes can change but then I also have to go and make a change of the role whereas from an attribute perspective I change the my, my attributes it's done there isn't that second step to go to a role and then also make a change uh, okay. Why or how is just easier? It seems to be so complexity is the enemy of security. Right? Yep. And it just seems to me like you've just said, oh, we need to do things here, it's all effective. So, what we're going to do is create them out here. Instead of managing 20 groups, we're going to manage 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And either the admin or worse yet, the administrative assistant at the front desk. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's still there's still going to be a, a data owner. Um, we're we're still going to have um, you know access to to information that's going to be stored. Um, I, I would say kind of how it probably currently is. So whatever whatever business process you currently have in place that it, that manages your SharePoint files, that manages your document and installation, whoever gets read, write, and create access, um, that's you know that's that's still going to be there. But what this is going to allow us to do is basically have that call out that says, should I have this access or not? So perhaps we don't leverage the internal mechanisms there and we, and we implement an access model like this. So, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I see that going forward, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, you know, when we look at it from man, from a manual perspective, you know, if we have somebody sitting there typing on a keyboard that enters in data, we have to assume a three percent error rate, which is not going to help help at all. 
So from an automation perspective, there, the, um, you know, for, for, so, I mean, I work for a company that has a solution that does this automation for us. So it can manage the, the, the attributes that change. It can manage that, that information. There's lots of, um, I would say, options out there that provide for the automatic changes of these attributes and so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there, there's still going to be a level of, of human um, interaction with any system, right? We have to put the data in there. We can't create it magically, right? We have to we have to put in the fields, but there's there, there's obviously options. We can make it more static. So somebody's not typing in a manager. They have to select it, right? Stuff like that. Okay. So is no, no. So SAML is a federation standard. So whenever I want to federate with uh, another company, another partnership, that is that SAML uh, insertion has my user attributes. Exacomo is the standard that would um, facilitate. Okay, what are those attributes, and is he allowed? Do we have? Do they match up? Do they meet the role that we have here? Yeah. So. Uh huh. Right, so this is this is a little higher level. I didn't, I didn't put I didn't put the other stuff in there. Yeah, but uh, I mean it's it's similar to this. So um, there's a good uh, Fedora site that has a lot of the good the good write up on it. Um, so from a, I mean, in the enterprise space, definitely axiomatics has been in the forefront of of the attribute based access control. Um, they, they, they've been around since probably about 2010. Um, and then I would say probably Microsoft with the, with the claims based access and Fedora around, you know, shortly after that is when they came in. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I think, uh, probably the leader right now is axiomatics is the big one pushing it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, um, not getting into the complexity of, of you know the rules that they, we can configure, um, it's easier to configure the exceptions. I would say in exact more to handle those um, than than in a role based uh, scenario. And I think if we come back and look at this slide here, right? Even if there is more complexity, there's still one place that we're, we're, we're we can put that. There's still one location where that can be stored, all in the policy decision point. We're not increasing the number of groups we're not increasing the number of you know objects in our directories to handle the exceptions um, I think from any standpoint we usually look at having about an 80 to 20 percent coverage with any access model right um, but uh, you know that being said uh, you know for any type of extreme one-offs right we just put we, we have to do it uh, statically and put it on the put on the actual object but uh, from what I've seen, definitely from this, this eliminates the, that, that incidence of, of having a, a role explosion scenario where we have double the amount of groups that we have our users because we've tried to capture all the exceptions. Right. In the example of the scenario where they have multiple groups where they groups, Yeah, good question. So. I mean, personally, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't implemented this per se to any customer site, but I will say that for those organizations, you know, I'm, I'm working with a large chip manufacturer in, in Boise, if you guys are familiar with the company like that in Boise, but they, I mean, that's a common example where they've had a, just a massive uh, overhaul of, of groups, and why is that? Because, I mean, lots of companies like this then 
they provide to the end user the ability to request a group and have that be created. And so then you have duplicate groups left and right all over the place. And whenever, I mean, unfortunately, you can't just drop a bomb and start over, um, but that's almost what it takes whenever you get into a really bad role s situation um, because there's no oversight, there's no management across it all. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Uh huh. Correct. So really, really, it all depends on the login system, right? So if I'm logging in with, you know, integrated Windows authentication, I'm going to bring some attributes with me there. So that may maybe that is just an Active Directory attribute change, a directory change, whatever it may be, wherever the attribute is coming from. And that's the other thing: we don't care where it comes from as long as we get it. Um, but from an IT perspective. It would, either, it would either be that. Either we need to change the attribute, so maybe we've added another attribute to the user that determines what system he should get access to, or we set up another rule that catches that. So instead of, instead of creating a rule, maybe we create a rule. Um, but from what, I've seen, from what I've seen and from what I've read, the, the rule-based scenario allows us to create much more of a static rule that then we might add an attribute onto the user you know, and and from my perspective, there's 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 plenty of attributes that we can add, or that we can change on a user to, to modify it.